that everybody's brackets were just shot. Oh, there you go. See, you know, and, I, and I'm sure Nick wasn't, you know, looking for the cats to win at all. You know. y- yeah, the wild cats. I, I, I don't think I could. I think I would hang myself with with the way that the Nick cats and, won? and and, and oh. Jill would go nuts. Anyway, so moving right along. Yeah. Welcome to another Monday morning a webinar. Uh, I'm excited to, that you guys joined us. Um, and we're going to hopefully uh, get this thing fixed. All right, here's what we got going today. Uh, Todd, you're going to obviously give us a look at the numbers. We've got Matt Baker here from Home Street. Give you your mortgage minute. I'm going to give you uh, your three-pack on your real estate plan. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about business plans and a, and a couple tips on putting together a business plan. You might, as an agent, go, why do I need a business plan? Well, if you're asking that question, you're, you you're already plan. behind the, the game. <laughs> and Dave Turnell here, uh, we're, there's a lot going on with the feds uh, when it comes down to these 1031 tax exchanges. And you hear about tax reform, and I, I think most agents – and including myself, was very clueless on what could possibly happen, what's coming down the pipe that could drastically affect uh, those of us that work with investors. And then uh, Bob, Bob's somewhere around here running around, so he will join us in a few minutes as usual and as always. If you miss anything this morning, you missed some of the slides, uh, you'd like some information, you have any questions about anything, feel free to email us at webinar at westusa.com, and we will get you that information as soon as possible. Todd, what's going on with the numbers? Well, Mike, I have the slides reversed today showing you the um, market uh, statistics ahead of the market stats form. I know that almost sounds like the same thing, but this is the spreadsheet version. And, of course, the uh, version that we, we put on the dashboard you'll see next. But the items in red are really the big story of the day. We're normally sitting somewhere around 27,000 average inventory at this time of the year. Uh, we've been averaging that right up through the end of February. However, as we've been discussing, the under contract accepting backup offers, uh, the uh, pendings have all of a sudden shot through the roof, uh, and we've been averaging in excess of 5,000 pendings, uh, which typically we were running about more like 4,000 here recently. Um, and that, that's sucking up the inventory. If you take a look at the inventory, we're eating up 25.98% of the market now uh, on a monthly basis. That is ridiculous. It's 3.85% uh, month supply, uh, which basically means under four, Mike, you know we're back into a seller's market. Um, this has been hovering somewhere right on the low end of that four. So, you know, we get over four, you know, somebody could say it's balanced. It's not really balanced until you get upwards of, you know, five, five and a quarter. But over six months supply, we're in a buyer's market. We really haven't seen that at at all. Um, it, I've heard some talk in the marketplace, ooh, buyer's market, buyer's market. I'm trying to figure out what Kool-Aid they're drinking. But realistically, uh, you know, we're still in a seller's market. Uh, the sale price, list price retention rose by 2%, which means the sellers aren't giving up as much either. Um, so, you know, that holiday market where we saw that uh, sale price, list price retention bounce down into the 94% range, that's gone. And we're back up to the 96.5, 96.7, and that's really where we normally are. About 3.3% uh, average uh, list price to sale price negotiation in there, not including your concessions on page two of the contract. So, um, you know, this is a very volatile time right now uh, the key right this particular moment if you got buyers and you're not looking for listings there's a you know <laughs> there's an issue coming in the marketplace if, if this inventory doesn't creep up and we're usually right about this particular time people are putting their properties on the market knowing that this summer market you know they're, they're trying to meet with the agents they want to know what do I got to do to put my house on the market what do I got to do to stage my house right well we wish they asked that but 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 that's really what they're saying you know and they want to get this stuff done Mike so that April May June you know while the kids are, are out of school uh, they that they can move and they can and they can sell their home and that's really what they're trying to do so normally this time of year we have listing inventory creeping up we don't so my recommendation is, you know, be, keep your eyes open and talk the word listing. Tell sellers right now is a great time to list because there isn't a lot, you know, the inventory is shrinking a little bit, which has forced it back to a 3.85 percent month, uh, 3.85 uh, month supply, and and as a result, uh, you know, the sellers just don't have to be as negotiative as they had been. Um, here's the stat sheet, and basically uh, you can take a look at it. 125, 129 days on market, uh, 3.85 uh, month supply. The uh, absorption rate's at 25.98. Average list price, Mike, is up over 460. Uh, we're averaging still. Uh, you know, we will see if this continues double-digit increase in sale price again this year, which, by the way, was anticipated, 10 to 14% increase in price. But this is supposed to be the last year. Going into 2016, we're supposed to see an average of 4 to 4.5% average growth. 
Um, the average sale price is 253 over the last three months. That number's been going down. If you take a look at the history on the previous uh, sheet, these are all available for you already this morning on the dashboard under market stats. And uh, the list price to sale price is 96.4. You can take a look at the rest of the inventory, but that's the way the, the inventory and the market's shaping up. All right. Thanks, Todd. Uh, yeah, interesting stuff. And as we always say, download this stuff, print this stuff, uh, use this stuff. Uh, when you talk with potential clients out there, um, it makes you look good. It makes you look knowledgeable. And um, and in a lot of ways, it's the agent who appears. Perception is reality. So uh, it's the agent that appears to be more knowledgeable is the one that sometimes uh, gets the deal. So, you know, this is just one of those things where if you keep seeing the numbers all of a sudden and you keep talking the numbers, all of a sudden you, you begin to be the statistician. All right. All right. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, real estate business plans. And like I said, if, if you're sitting there and you don't have a business plan, you're a little bit behind the eight ball. And this is the thing that we, we try so hard and, and so many times taught to communicate to our agents is as a real estate agent, you are an entrepreneur. You have to think in terms of an entrepreneur, and you have to, and you're building your own business. You are you're building your own business, and uh, and at any time that you're going to build a business, and let's say you're going to go to the bank or you're going to seek some sort of investment, you have to have a business plan. They won't even talk to you. Absolutely, they, you've got to have a vision for where you're headed. It's like that Cheshire Cat thing. You know, when they came to the fork in the road and they said, "Well, what's your where are you headed?" And the person said, "No, I'm not sure." And then the Cheshire Cat said, "Well, I guess then it doesn't matter which way you go. <laughs> if you have no idea where you're headed, how the heck are you ever going to get there?" So we're going to talk a little bit about business plans. Uh, number one, if you have a business plan and or you've begun the business plan, do not leave it incomplete. I come across more business owners, more people in business that because I and I'm going to be honest with you, putting together a business plan is can can be a very daunting task, um, and so a lot of people kind of get knee deep into it and and kind of quit on it. And so if you've started a business plan and or you're going to do a business plan, you have to finish what you start. Don't leave it incomplete, and make sure it is complete and includes uh, compete, but complete and includes all the important variables. There are so many variables that go into putting together a business plan, such as you know budget, conversion rates, marketing, conversion rates, where you're going to market, and and so forth. And I would just say I would Google real estate business plan and you'd be amazed on what's going to pop up to see what other people have done you know what are the variables that go into a business plan um, because that is just something that, that that we've got to do so if you've started one uh, I know at the beginning of every year we talk about it a lot of people come and take some classes mm -hmm. and invariably they we, we don't complete it so I think it's something that we need to to go back address and complete and then Todd kind of piggybacking on on your report Research and know the trends. If, if I'm constantly knowing the trends, if I'm constantly knowing where the real estate market is going, as, as you've pointed out, there's been a lot of talk that this is a buyer's market, mm -hmm. but it may not be. It may be more of a seller's market. We'll know that. Yeah, because putting together your business plan is going to impact what's in the business plan. Absolutely, you know, and that's one of the things that you know we do here for you. Actually, for free, you know, there isn't much in life for free. But you know, here at West USA, with no obligation, you can reach out and meet with one of your one of the coaches in one of the offices. Sit down, go through the contract, uh, go through your your business plan, create an action plan, and it has all the statistics and information Mike's talking about. Mike, you and I usually don't share any of your uh, you know. Uh, three pack tips of the day ahead of time so you know don't know if you have anything already in step two or three there about that but again it deals with everything and and you know meeting with a coach they do this every single day it makes it become simple for you you don't have to sweat the details they will help you and it's not their numbers it's your numbers that's a good point because I wasn't going to talk about that but yes we do have people in each office who can help us achieve these goals number two it should not be vague Okay, this is where business plans, you know, if, it's, if it's overly vague, you might as well not have one. It's like people say, hey, I'm going to have my best year ever. Really? Well, what does that mean? <laughs> so I, it, it's, important, pretty vague. it's important to keep in mind business plans are not stories, novels, or mere thoughts. Hey, I'm going to have a great year. You should hey. put that in your book. <laughs> okay, well. That's pronounced. Yeah, yeah, I need to, I need to write a book. Uh, business plans are not stories, novels, or mere thoughts. Um, a reasonably intelligent person with a high school education should be able to understand it. So if I've put together a business plan and I've articulated 
my goals, my objectives, my plan of attack, how I'm going to achieve my goals, my research, and so forth. Really, the litmus test is can I put it in front of somebody that's decently, you know, intelligence, graduated high school, and they're not all one and the same. I've seen a lot of people that graduated high school that, you know, <laughs> some would say that about me. <laughs> but um, if, if they read it, would they understand it? Yeah. Yeah, that's a key thing with anything you do, even with the ads that you post with, with terms in a contract. Make it make it easy to be read, and meaning as far as make it understandable. All right. And number three, leave out unfounded and unrealistic assumptions. We can't project – we can't assume projections. I can't just say, hey, you know what, this year I'm going to close 50 deals. Well, how are you going to close 50 deals? How am I going to do that? What is my plan of attack? Just throwing that on there, it may, may make me look good. Hey, I'm going to close 50 deals, but now you're just making assumptions that you're going to close 50 deals. What, what, what effort, what plan are you going to utilize to get there? Don't assume market conditions. There you go. Okay? There's a lot of people that have made already assumptions what the rest of this year is going to be like. It goes back to constantly studying and research. And then don't assume you know your target audience. Obviously, we've talked a lot about this. Um, there, the whole marketing industry as a whole is starting to really pay attention to the millennials and nobody quite knows what they're gonna do about them how they're going to market to them but you also no matter who your target market is whether it's military whether it's elderly whether it's investors whether I'm gonna go after millennials or I'm gonna go after middle age middle income you you can't make assumptions that you know them you have to research them and get to know them. Absolutely. You know, and, and this is the same thing as, you know, if somebody says, yeah, well, I'm gonna, I want to earn this amount of money and I'm going to sell this many units. And the question is, okay, where do you do your marketing? I mean, it's all the same kind of thing. It, you know, if you're trying to fish for salmon, you might catch one in Puget Sound. But the reality is if you can go up the river, you know, every you know, there's 98% salmon in that river. So you really got to, you know, you want to look at that. We talked it last week, you know, that $1,000 a month apartment complex, remember? And, and the conversation was, you know, if you're trying to sell a properties that have a thousand dollar a month payment you know you could do that but to, to start searching an 800 or 750 apartment complex well that'd be a waste of dollars at least it won't help you achieve your goal so you have to know your target audience well you you've talked about a fork in the road and salmon now if you keep oh, yeah. it up i'm gonna i'm gonna get really hungry and cranky here <laughs> can we can we change the analogies to non-food items please <laughs> anyways if you'd like some more information you about that coach. If, if, if you have not sat down to be to begin a business plan see one of our coaches because really again we are all entrepreneurs here we're all small business owners and if you don't have a business plan you, you don't know where you're going a few announcements um, regardless of your experience your years here at West USA if you've not been to a corporate orientation in a long time you need to do that uh, I always say I come across agents that have been here 10 15 years and I start talking about circle picks or I start talking about some of those things that are like, I don't know what that is. Uh, you need to come, and you're invited to come to a, a one of our corporate orientation webinars. If you're new here to West USA, I met a couple new agents at our surprise uh, potluck on Friday and told them they need to get here to the, to the corporate orientation. Otherwise, you're not going to know the services and all the offerings that we have for you. So you can find that information on the dashboard. It will be on our Facebook page this week. So get registered. Join us on April 6th. So it's in a couple weeks at 930. Also, our next React takes a, begins that Monday afternoon. If you don't know what React is, we've talked. Uh, we've already talked about millennials. Uh, I know there's a lot of people that that are intimidated by social media, intimidated by utilizing a CRM, but you have to begin to speak the language at React. Uh, we will teach you how to use our agent dashboard. We will teach you how to set up a lot of your social media sites, uh, implement them, and we'll also teach you how to use Real Future. So. Get signed up for that. And then lastly, on the announcement list, there is a lot of, and Todd, maybe you can speak this on, on this for a minute. There's a lot of changes coming down the pipe when it comes down to RESPA laws, what companies can do, what title companies can provide. I think people are going to wake up one day and get really ticked at their title company because they, they, they may not be able to provide things. So we're offering a couple classes. Why don't you talk? Well, you know, the big thing is uh, you're going to see the difference August 1st <laughs> because as of, you know, new contracts that are written after August 1st, uh, there should also be a new AAR contract uh, that you're going to be notified about uh, that's going to be effective August 1st. 
and uh, you're going to really need to plug into that training. We're going to try to offer it numerous times here. Uh, Marge is all over it uh, in our education department, but uh, it, you know we can't offer it and can't train it if, until it comes out. But it's really an important thing. But uh, you know what's happening here is the way lending has been done, and it's been promoted by the uh, you know Frank Dodd Act and the and and the CFPB. Uh, you know these guys. It, you know I'm not saying that that it's a bad thing. It's just a, a change. We have to get used to the change. But the key indication of why you need to attend. I don't care if you've been doing this for 40 years. You need to attend because the way the game is played is changing, and and it's okay. It's not a big thing. You just need to be known about it. You need to know. Well, actually, it is a big thing. Let me rephrase that. But it, it's not a lot to interpret, internalize. Uh, it's something that you're going to have to have, uh, and and it is going to start uh, August 1st. Okay, and uh, and everybody should have by now at 10 o'clock. We actually sent out an email blast with a flyer yep. uh, with the the link to register for this class. So their their classes are free. There's two opportunities. Uh, they're on the flyer. So and then you can always check the dashboard. So make sure you get signed up. Be in the know. And there's one more thing about this topic too, Mike, is the fact that uh, these people that are coming to teach it are the are the leading knowledge. The people that have the most amount of knowledge as to where the rules and laws are as of the date of this meeting. Uh, and this is critical because uh, and Matt can speak to this. There's there's a lot of lenders out there that are downplaying the effect of this. You're, you're, I will tell you, if, if they say this is not a big issue, don't worry about it, that is a red flag. Well, speaking of Matt Baker, I, I feel like I always need to apologize to you because that three pack I pretty much nailed it, and then you've got to you've got to follow I in my follow footsteps. That. Yeah, so yeah. good luck to you. How's it going? Yeah, you know what? It's good. And and one thing that you that that resonates with me uh, when that and I'm coached as as well as and and I actually have a coaching session tomorrow. But the, what my coach always tells me is is by when, right? Smart is the is the goal. Has anyone heard the term smart before? Specific, measurable. I've, I've never attainable. been called that. No. All right. Well, there's a there's a, a term called to, to actually put a, a a time definition on your goal. It's called SMART. Um, Google it. it. It's it's pretty um, pretty intended. But if you're going to put a goal in the play, you want to make it smart. So let's jump into the market real quick. Um, rates did improve slightly last week, uh, based on some subtle nuances that the Fed came out with in regards to where their rate is moving to. Um, so what did that do for rates? Well, we Conventional tick down to four, um, FHA 3.875 for a 600 borrower, 375 for a 660 or pl uh, plus borrower. Jumbo rates also moved lower. Um, what's going to happen in the future? I I'm really cautious right now. I think the I think that any positive news, which you would think would do good for mortgage rates, is actually opposite. Any positive news regards to our economy, rates will go up, and they will probably go up quickly so you know now that you, you know anytime you get a little bit of a dip you want to make sure you let everybody know and you can take advantage of it so that's my rate update for the day um you guys have a ton of great news today obviously uh you know the the, the uh, a lot of the indicators are showing for you know under four percent uh um you know uh, uh, market appreciation all whatever all the all the good numbers and i got some bad news for you uh and it's not really bad news it's just different news but we have some significant income calculation changes that Fannie Mae came out with, and it goes into and it goes into place on not only rental income but on self-employed borrowers. So, and I don't like using this form all the time for you know specific guidelines, but this is some pretty big stuff. I feel like it's worth mentioning. If a borrower includes the property on a Schedule E, so that means they have rental income. Uh, and they've put on the Schedule E, and they're, they're but they're partially they own it partially. So they maybe it's a husband and wife, and they own it 50-50. Uh, and the note and the deed of trust is in the borrower's name. So you know they, they're on title and they're on the note. You you have um, you have to hit them 100% uh, for the debt, e even if another party is paying a percentage of the payment. A good example would be um, mother uh, mother uh, dad paying for, um, you know, they, they co-signed for a loan, and the daughter or the son's been making those payments for a year. You could, in the past, use 12 months cancel checks to prove that the, they're not obligated, they're paying it. It doesn't fly like that anymore. If they're on the loan, it doesn't matter with a percentage. You have to hit them 100%. Um, next one, this is if the borrower is on the deed or title, let's just say, in, in our state, if this is on title, but they're not obligated on the mortgage, and you don't, you can, you can exclude it. Um, from their calculations, which is a little different of a change, but they added some really ridiculous caveat that you have to hit them for 100% of the taxes, but you don't have to hit them for anything else, which 
is actually a, a change because if they were it was if it was included on their um, taxes again, like a husband and wife, you would still have to hit them for their percentage. Now, now you don't if they're not obligated on the mortgage and they're not on title. The um, and and this is I can put this up on the on the the dashboard um, later. If the borrower is not on title and is obligated to the mortgage, then you have to then you can exclude the whole payment. However, you don't get the benefit of using rental income, right? So it's like if you if you're gonna not hit them for it um, on the on the, the the negative side, then you can't give them it on the positive side either. Um, again, really slight, a little confusing, but definitely some change, nuance change that can um, can can hit us. Uh, the next one, if you just go uh, go again. So Fannie Mae also came out with uh, what you think is just a a, a rather obscure clarity, um, but they said that the lenders required to obtain the most two years using your business income to qualify. But they added this little caveat and they said lenders may only use business income when there is a history of income distribution to the borrower that is consistent with the level being used to qualify. So there are some businesses where you make money and you keep it in the business, right? You retain your earnings, you don't, and you can, you would have been able in the past to use that for qualifying. Um, or to some portion of it. A lot of times you have income that's passed through. Um, you know, you want to check with your CPA. A lot of, you know, well, most realtors are, are self-employed in this nature. So if they have um, LLCs or, or 1120 corporations and they're keeping money in the business and it's and it's not actually being flowed through to the personal tax returns in the form of distributions, you may not be able to use that income going forward April 1st. <sighs> Again, a lot of little nuances. They're subtle, but they're worth mentioning because they could have some drastic impact. Now, you kind of feel like, gosh, self-employed self -employed borrowers get the short end of the, of the stick in most cases, and this is sort of, you know, hit, kicking them again. Um, well, you know, I feel like this may be enough for us to start seeing product in the future that can help self-employed borrowers. And you know that's that magic word, stated income, but... Uh, there's a, a real possibility that this additional clarification from Fannie Mae is enough to get people motivated to um, on the on the investor side to come into a stated product. And we've been told that um, this year, mainly the first half of the year, we should we may see something like that. So um, this maybe is further um, you know indication that it's going to come. So anyway, that's my uh, update for the day. I know it was a really brief and quick. You can always email me at uh, matt.baker at homestreet.com or any one of our uh, loan officers that work in your branches. Yeah, Thanks. this is uh, this is huge, and I mean, I mean, we've all. I mean, if, if, if chances are, I mean, there's a high percentage that your next borrower or your next buyer is going to be self-employed, and this yeah. is this is huge. So, so uh, I know we went through it fast, but if uh, you're working with a self-employed buyer and uh, you need a little more clarification, uh, stop in and see any of these guys. They are in our branches. Yeah, let's get them pre-approved first. I think that's the key thing, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Matt. All right. Well, speaking of the feds and the government, yay, government. Uh, some more changes may be coming, and this will be in the form of a 1031 tax, ex in the area of 1031 tax exchanges. And if you're not as familiar with 1031 tax exchanges, I just need to be upfront that this is we're not going to really get into the the basics of what they are. You should, especially you should become familiar with them, especially if you work with investors. But for those of us that have worked with investors, those of us that, that have had investments, we're familiar with 1031 tax exchanges. And I can tell you, I'm learning it is something that we have maybe taken for granted. Uh, because the feds want to, as usual, get involved in our business and mess with things. We have Dave Turnell here. He is the vice president for the states of Arizona and New Mexico for Investment Property Exchange Services. Dave, welcome. And, my goodness, what's going on? <laughs> well, thanks for having me this morning. Uh, you know, tax reform uh, is, well, it is one of the big topics that come across to, in Washington right now. A lot of people are talking about it. Um, when you probably see it on the television, I'm sure you just click and turn the channel. Um, but if you are in the, the real estate industry uh, and you work with investors, then 1031 is, is obviously a tool that you know and that you've used in the past to help not only your clients but maybe even yourself. And, and, and basically, uh, you know, the, the main goal in, in Washington right now is, is corporate tax reform. And the current administration... Uh, wants to lower the existing rate of, uh, I believe it's 35%, down to 28%. And, and the, whole, the whole reason they want to do this 
is to prevent inversions. Now, uh, I'm sure most of you aren't familiar with inversions, but basically what's happened, because of the fact that we have the, basically the highest corporate tax rate in the world, a lot of companies have relocated their, uh, their headquarters uh, overseas. Uh, so, and this allows them to avoid paying uh, taxes on foreign profits. Well, obviously, we want to get the, that taxable income back into the United States, so uh, you know they're going to lower that corporate tax rate. And, and the administration, you know, I mentioned, is 28 percent. They want to lower it to 28 uh, percent. The Republican goal is to drop it to 25 percent, but also uh, extend that 25 percent rate to include pass-through entities. Uh, obviously, that w would help small businesses. Um, and and you know that's that's really the main goal. Now, obviously, if they drop the rate from say 35 down to 28 or even 25 percent, well, obviously that is a a, a huge loss of revenue um, to the, the federal government. Now, now the interesting thing is that, well, the Congre congressional budget office um, they take it the calculation and, and assume that they're going to collect all the the money on the foreign profits that they're not collecting. And so in their calculations, it's it's kind of one of those Washington things where it doesn't make any sense. Well, couldn't they uh, just spend less? Oh, wait. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Silly me. Well, well yeah, no, that, that is an option, but uh, not not probably a real option. Now, um, so, so let's move to the next one. Why is Section, Section 1031 a target? Well, uh, under the Congressional Budget Office, they, they scored 1031 as the – it was the third largest expenditure uh, out of all the budgets, and, and it said it, you know, would generate 11.7 billion in revenue a year over a 10-year time period, uh, 98 billion using the static scoring model. Now, again, this is another term that I don't know if anybody's familiar with this, but there's there's two types of of, of scoring models. There's a static, which which basically uh, that's what the Congressional Budget Office is using currently, and and they state that you know if we, if we sell 100 properties this year, they assume that if they repeal 1031 and it's gone, that there is going to be another. 100 properties sold in the next year, and, and we all know that that's generally not the case. Um, dynamic scoring, which is the other model, takes into consideration you know, basically what would happen uh, as far as for market market uh, you know activities. Obviously, um, sellers would not sell; they most likely would hold on to their properties longer. But but anyway, um, that that's what they're looking at. Can we go to the the next one? Go ahead. Uh, why also is 1031 under attack? Well, a lot of People in Washington think it's a it's a tax loophole for the rich, uh, and uh, and then there's one. Keep going to the next slide if you would for me. And and, and then they also say it's confusing. Uh, you know the the big buzzword in Washington is to make our tax code uh, you know more simple if you would. Uh, and, and they're saying that under Section 1031 the definition of like kind is confusing. And, and so those are the 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 tar those are the reasons why 1031 is a target, or at least that's what they're saying in Washington. Um, and when we, and when you say it's a target, I yeah. mean are they I mean, I'm, I'm sure we'll get to it. Are they possibly trying to eliminate it? Yeah. Actually, if you go to the next slide, um, back in, in, in early 2014, uh, there was a bill uh, put out by a, a senator in, I think it was Michigan. It was Dave Camp's bill, and uh, he was a Republican. And within that bill, uh, there was full repeal of Section 1031. Uh, now, that bill did not go anywhere. Um, but the, the downside is is that uh, they are actually using that bill, or at least they've stated that they're going to use the camp bill as kind of a, an outline for this new bill and this new legislation that could be coming as soon as June or July. And and so when I say that, a lot of that you know perks a lot of ears because of the fact that you know 1031 literally could be gone in June or July. Um, that obviously affects me, but it's also going to affect a number of different people's uh, people in, in different industries as well. Um, the House Ways and Means came, you know, that was the, the bill that was put out by the House Ways and Means. Uh, the Treasury uh, out of the White House, uh, their their budget, uh, their fiscal year budget in both the 2015 and 16 fiscal year budget came out. And basically it put a limit on 1031 exchanges, so it modified it, and it would only uh, allow investors to defer a million dollars in taxes annually. Um, and in addition to that, um, it would also exclude art and collectibles. So, you know, all those individuals that own those collector cars at Barrett Jackson and they're selling them, and, and or artwork or anything else, those are would be now eliminated under that plan. Uh, under the under the Senate's proposal, under Max Baucus, um, you know, theirs was again to repeal 1031, but they left the door open for real property. So, I mean, 
if personal property went away, exchanges went away, at least we'd have real property. But again, we, we don't want to be in any of these bills. And so those, that's what's kind of currently going on in Washington as far as the different bills that have been introduced. Now, um, just to kind of you know, make an argument, uh, you know, as you know, under 1031, they're not tax-free. Taxes are deferred. They're not eliminated. Uh, you know, that everybody, you know, a lot of people in Washington think that, you know, if we do 1031s, well, they're never going to have to pay those taxes. But, but that's not the case. They're deferred. Eventually, you know, when you cash out and take the cash, you will pay, you know, pay your, pay your gain. You'll pay your taxes. Now, uh, again, as we just said, the gain doesn't go away. They will be paid, uh, you know, whether you take it all the way to your grave and then, you, you know, some, depending upon the state tax law, you know, your children were, will either inherit it. Uh, with some steps up, step up, or if there is no step up in that year, then you know they're just going to inherit the tax liability. And again, over the tax life of depreciable asset, 1031 is really revenue neutral, and that's also a big buzzword in Washington as well. We want to remain revenue neutral. All right. Um, you know, next slide if you would. Thanks. Uh, like kind exchanges are used by a broad spectrum of taxpayers. It's not just a, a loophole for the rich. Uh, I mean, I work with everybody. Uh, I mean, I can't tell you how broad the spectrum is. I can, I'll get a phone call during my day from a, a gentleman selling a you know fifty million dollar multifamily apartment complex, and then I'll also get a call from a guy who's making you know ten twenty thousand dollars on a residential rental uh, and, and everything in between. And, and so again, this is really you know a, a tool that pretty much any taxpayer can take advantage of, whether they're just starting out as an investor or if they've been doing it for years and have built this, you know, huge investment company. Uh, if you look at the numbers there, 60% of our exchanges involve properties with equity less than a million and 33% are less than 500,000. And so, uh, you know, uh, people are, are moving. I mean, that means, uh, you know, they're, they're moving in between uh, properties, which is also good for the economy. Uh, 1031 is consistent with other parts of the tax code. Uh, you're not allowed to take unrealized losses as a deduction and it doesn't uh, tax unrealized gain. And so, you know, these these kind of debunk all the myths that are out there. If we can move to the next slide, that'd be great. Now, like kind, if, you're, if, if you've been to one of my uh, classes or presentations, you've learned that like kind is very, very broad. Um, <laughs> it's really real estate for real estate. Uh, and pretty much, you know, anything held for investment or using a business qualifies. So it's pretty, pretty simple. That's the real property side. If we, you know, we also do personal property exchanges. So, so aircraft for aircraft, oil and gas for oil and gas, you know, tractors for tractors, trucks for trucks, cars for cars. You know, that, that seems pretty simple to me, right? Now, let's go to the next one. Outcome, if, if 1031 is eliminated, um, obviously there's going to be a chilling effect on the economy. Uh, when we uh, did the numbers, uh, IPX is owned by uh, F&F Corporate, and, and, and they control uh, about 50% of the real estate transactions in the country. And, and so they just took the data that, that we have from that and, and crossed it with how many 1031 exchanges that we've, we've done, and that number was right around 40%. And if, if 1031 goes away, you can be guaranteed that, that there's definitely going to be less transactions out there. And that, and that hurts, obviously, uh, everybody in the real estate industry. And, and so that's, that's really going to be the biggest chilling effect because we're going to have, basically, we're just going to have investors that aren't going to sell because they have either, you know, too big of a tax hit and, and they don't want to pay the big tax bill. Um, obviously, reduction in real estate values, economic stagnation, job loss, no additional revenue to the U.S. Treasury, you know, that's one thing that people don't really realize. 1031 is actually a revenue generator for the, for the service, for the IRS, for the government. Uh, and again, it's significantly less revenue for state and local governments because we're not getting those transactions either. So Yeah, and, and the thing that gets me, and I know this is the status quo for the federal government, especially when they, you know, put forth any new regulations. And, and this is both sides of the aisle, so oh, I'm not, you know. Exactly. But it's, there. there's no consideration for the little man. It's, yeah. it's, you know, if, if they eliminate the 1031 tax exchanges, investors are more likely to just hang on to these properties, okay? So there'll be less opportunities for other people to buy properties, less opportunities. Every house that's held is one less commission for the realtor. Yeah. You know, and, and it's just, it is. It's just that the, the downline is tremendous, but all they, it, we all know, it seems like all they care about is their own coffers. Well, yeah, I, I it's a bipartisan effort because the reality is, is it affects, you know, it doesn't matter if you're Republican, Democrat, independent, what are you? Everybody uses 1031. And again, if they take it away, it's going to affect everybody. Now, um, if we go 
back last year, you know, when this whole, uh, when the Dave Camp bill came out in, in December, and it had the repeal of 1031. As you can imagine, uh, the 1031 industry was kind of not really happy about that because, well, obviously, <laughs> for, for obvious reasons. And, and so uh, we put a team together, and, and we, we tried to, to, to get meetings with everybody that sits on the House Ways and Means Committee. And the president of our company, uh, John Wunderlich, uh, he's out of Chicago. Uh, he also is a, a regional for Fidelity, and he called over in Wisconsin, and he – you know, called all of his, his friends over there and said, hey, is there an opportunity to get a meeting with Paul Ryan? And because Paul Ryan is going to be the uh, chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee. Um, well, he is now, but back then he, it was most likely. And anyway, it, it ended up that uh, they ended up getting a meeting. And they got 20 minutes on a Monday. And he got a phone call on Friday that basically said, hey, be in Janesville on Monday at this time. And so you know, he called one of the one of the one of our bigger clients, uh, Northwestern Mutual, who who does a lot of business in Wisconsin. Uh, they did, I think, eight hundred million dollars worth of ten thirty one exchanges uh, in two thousand and ten. Uh, we also grabbed a, a farmer from Illinois because you know when you talk about Wisconsin, that's what is that the cheese capital of the world? <laughs> yeah, I like cheese and, and dairy, and so and, and basically we brought some some constituents from from the you know. Janesville and Paul Ryan's uh, district. And so they went to this meeting and they flew in. They got in a little bit early. They got to the, the, the office. And, and I don't know about you, but, you know, when I, when I envision what a, you know, a senator's office is going to look like, I, I kind of think it's going to be pretty nice. Um, but when they got there, they said they've kind of walked into this older, dilapidated building and there was this door with a double mirror on it, so kind of like a security mirror. Right. <laughs> the receptionist walk them into this 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 room. The carpet was kind of worn out, and they walk into this room with a like a Walmart plastic folding table and some metal chairs. And he said the only really the nice thing the nicest thing in the room was the flag in the corner, and the phone was on a TV tray. <laughs> well, it, it's because they they did not buy the building utilizing a 1031 tax exchange. It's probably so, the case. So had they used a 1031 tax exchange, there'd have been a little more deferred money there to to exactly. buy something nicer. So um, so basically, they get into this room, and actually, Paul Ryan uh, showed up about uh, 10 minutes early, and so they got 30 minutes, and they had a great conversation with him. Um, one of the questions that 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 you know they started the the, the discussion was was they asked Paul Ryan they said what do you know about 1031 and his, and his reply was you know do people use it a lot and at that point we kind of went oh great he doesn't know a lot about it. well actually I think he was sandbagging because the, the meeting went great you know we went through all the, the, the benefits of a 1031 and, and he's told us three things he said he says listen he goes if you don't like the CBO numbers you got to do your own study and that's what you see up here we did our own study Ernst and Young study highlights and it basically shows that you know if we repeal 1031, it's you know it's not it's not going to be good. Um, he also said that um, he would order uh, the congressional budget office to do dynamic scoring, so that's going to be a benefit for us. And, and he's done that. And then uh, the, the the last thing he told us was that you know we don't want to make the same mistake that we made in 1986. And, and Tax Reform Act of 1986 was really bad for the economy. Uh, it basically led us into the SNL issues, and then which led us into the uh, recession of the early 90s. And so we, we came away from that meeting feeling great, um, it, like he knows what he's talking about. Uh, and, and so that was positive. Um, if we go to the next slide, obviously the benefits of 1031, we all know those. Um, the predictions, uh, basically, again, we're waiting for this bill to come out, and they said it's going to be out in June or July. Paul Ryan said he wants to have legislation out before their summer break. Um, so the first one there is, is Republicans pass a bill and you know Obama vetoes it, which is likely. Um, you know they're going to probably run on that in 2016. If there's bipartisan support, this is kind of the scariest one uh, because they want to improve their reputation up there that they can work across the aisle. It would generally go fast. And, and again, if we're in that bill, that's not good. Um, and if it does get passed and we're in the bill, then we got to get a senator to sponsor an amendment to get us out of it. But that's you know kind of the third bridge. And if there's a grand bargain, which nobody thinks that'll happen, um, but uh, those are the three options. And so what we've done is we built a coalition of, of 60 associations, and, and it's every major organization out there. I mean, CCIM, NAOP, all those international council of shopping centers, there's a number of them there. But it, it's not just real estate. It's, it's personal property as well. Um, We've had other meetings out there. Actually, in the last two weeks, um, there's been an onslaught on Washington. We've taken our, our 
our economic study to everybody in the uh, House Ways and Means Committee as well as the Senate Finance Committee, and we've had great meetings out there, and, and, and it's, you know, we've taken that, we're hosting dinners to basically tell not only the actual senators, but their staffers that actually write the legislation uh, about 1031 as well. Um, if you want to read that, that, that study, you can actually go to 1031taxreform.com and download it. Um, we're also uh, in conjunction with the Real Estate Roundtable, which is uh, more geared on commercial real estate. They're also doing their own study uh, based on, and that'll be out uh, in April 2015, and that study is based on more commercial. Um, we actually have our own uh, grassroots letter campaign that we're sending out uh, through our website at IPX1031. If you go to IPX1031.com and under the tax reform tab, it'll actually bring you to the next slide here um, that, that basically has, uh, you know, if you click on tax reform, it'll take you to an area where you basically fill out your email, your zip code. It'll pull up your legislators, and there'll be a pre-populated letter. You can edit that, and it basically just explains, you know, what's going on with 1031, why it's so important to not only the real estate industry but the economy in general. And if you could just do that, um, that would be great. Um, you know, and that's what we're doing grassroots. In addition to that, if you if anybody has uh, contacts with legislators. Uh, be it in uh, that sit on the House Ways and Means Committee or the Senate Finance Can Committee, uh, uh, just give me a call, and, and if we can set up a meeting, we will fly to either Washington or meet them in district uh, to just sit down and have discussions with them. But uh, that is pretty much the presentation, and it's kind of an update, but again, uh, we'll kind of keep you posted of what's going on with this 1031 thing, and, and hopefully nothing, but, uh, but you never know with Washington. We could uh, see something as soon as June or July. So Now, I, everybody, I mean, I've been... I've been doing the webinar here for for over a year, and and I've never issued an alarm, and never really said, "Hey, folks, this is." But this is bad. If if they if this even if you have never worked with an investor, and even if you're not even sure what a 1031 tax exchange is, you need to become familiar with it. But and and, and what's scary to me is it. it Regardless, it sounds like something's coming down the pipe. We just don't necessarily know what it is. Folks, we have to get on here. I've, and I've never done a cry of, hey, go, let's send a letter, you know, because everybody does that. But for those of us in real estate, which should be all of us that are, <laughs> on, the that are, that are on the webinar, <laughs> yeah. um, this, is, uh, this is serious stuff. So, um, Dave, we really appreciate that. Appreciate you coming by. Um, on a, and and if, you, if you want – a copy of these slides if you want that that email address again uh, if you didn't get a chance to write it down um, you can go here but you can always email us at webinar at westusa.com and uh, and we just uh, yeah we need to we need to make a big push Bob I know you had a, a comment if you know if you, if you do sell a, a big property for someone that does a 1031 exchange and, and they get the money out of this thing you can probably sell them three or four more houses as, as a real estate agent, so this has got to work for you too. There's a lot of money there, and it can be spread around into many commission dollars for you. All right, uh, Dave, appreciate you coming by, and uh, do uh, do keep us informed. We appreciate it. Will do. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Dave. All right, Bob, that was a that was actually a good find. Good job, Bob. You brought Dave to us. I've known him for many years. Yes. All right, Bob, uh, keep us out of trouble. What do you think? Well, let's see if we can keep you out of trouble. One of, one of the things here is, um, and I don't believe I mentioned this last week. I, I may have. It was on Monday here that it happened. But uh, here's somebody that bought a, a property next to a railroad and didn't notice the railroad. So the uh, fellow now is, has seen the railroad, and he's mad as hell at the real estate agent up in Wickenburg. He's mad at her. He wants out of this deal. Well, can he get out of the deal? Well, the inspection period is over with. So, no, no, he can't get out that way. Well, let's take a look at the spuds then. They filled out a spuds on the other side. And did they talk about number 202? That talks about railroads. Is there a railroad there? They didn't answer it at all. So now we're asking for an update of the spuds which means if they update it, then we got five days to review it, and we crash the deal if that's what the buyer wants. Well, they didn't do any of that stuff, so now they are canceling it because of the failure 
to disclose clauses, and uh, th they'll be able to get out of this. I don't know if this, this lady's out of it yet, but uh, anyway, I called legal hotline on that just to uh, firm it up a lot and make sure that I was on the right track there. So I hope that got taken care of. Then I got another lady. This is something I haven't talked about in years and years. And, and this uh, contract here, purchase contract for new home with a lot. And this was built in, let's see, this uh, contract was put together in April of 2005. And I don't recall anybody ever using it. But now one of our gals has found a property and they want her to use this purchase contract for new home. So that's 10 years ago this thing was penned. I wonder how that's going to work. So I went and read this thing. And don't do one of these things unless you call me. Just don't do it. It's a lot of funny stuff here. It talks about additional personal property. Well, if there's nothing there, there is no personal property. So what are they talking about there? I don't know. Uh, there's what about draws it talks in here about cash if it's an all cash deal with draws you sell a three hundred thousand dollar house and they put all the money down then they have to build it but they build it on the buyer's money oh i hate that they're building it on the buyer's money so there you go you have to be real careful of that and it's contingent upon the buyer qualifying for a loan, so that's okay. The um, What about the appraisal? Who's going to buy the appraisal? That's, you've got check marks in here, buyer or seller. Well, I don't know. Wouldn't there already be an appraisal on, on most of these lots in there? I, I, I don't know. So you have to be careful that if a, a buyer does this and pays for that appraisal, why well, they may be... Uh, lose that money if they don't really go through with this deal. Appliances. What about appliances? Do you get appliances with a house? Usually you do. Maybe you're going to have a house built with no appliances in it. That's something to think about. So if there's appliances and the listing agent says, yes, we're going to give you a stove, refrigerator, and all these things, get the serial numbers off of them, make sure you got the right things, which ones are going to be, and write those into the contract. Line 103. Why did I broke down line 103? Buyer is aware that failure to have the funds necessary to obtain the loan and close this transaction shall be considered a material breach of contract. That used to be in all the contracts years ago. Now we have a cure period. There's no cure periods in this thing. None at all. So this will be a material breach of contract and not a failure to qualify, and you're going to lose your earnest money. Insulation, it says here. How much insulation? How much insulation do you think Mike should be put in a house? Lots. Lots. Lots of insulation. But does anybody, you know, one of us guys, do we? I don't know how much insulation should be put in there. I really don't. You almost have to go to a home builder and say how much you have in this house and figure that that might be about right. I wouldn't have any idea. R13, R38, whatever it is. and you, So you have to fill this out with the insulation stuff, inspections and warranties and stuff. This is a very complicated contract. Um, if, if you get ready to do one, Let's get together. Now, one of our gals, she went ahead and wrote one. Let's see how that works out for her. Uh, the people wanted the house. And so they're going to have it built by some fellow. And it turned out to be, I believe it was Hancock Homes that's going to build it. So uh, that's a reputable organization. So I was okay with that. But that's just one of those things. Now, here's something else I, I wanted uh, to put out here, good stories of surprise sales. I don't mean the surprise office. I mean surprise sales. Do you ever have any of those? Sometimes there are surprises that uh, people weren't expecting a sale somewhere. Uh, it's, well, let me give an example. Here's uh, 
the fellow we had last week, uh, Chuck Polson, he was down in the pits at Daytona and was talking to some fellow down there, and they exchanged cards. This guy says, oh, I've got a, a house up there in Glendale, and uh, one of these days I'll be coming up there to sell it. And they exchange cards, and finally, seven years later, Chuck gets a call from a fellow that he met at Daytona and sold his house for him up here in Glendale. That's a surprise sale because you're marketing yourself all the time. Well, are you really marketing yourself all the time? I don't know. Maybe you are. Maybe you're not. And then Bob and Mary Millard over in Hawaii, they're sitting on a seat waiting for a plane to come back to the States. Got to talking with some fellow, found out he has some business over here in Mesa. Gave him a card and says, hey, if you're ever around Mesa, give us a call. We'll have dinner. Well, he got back here to Mesa, and Bob and Mary are here and actually turned that card giveaway there into seven sales. Is that unexpected business? Another gal the other day, uh, some guy got her card. And because she's the best real estate salesman in Mesa, according to the fellow that handed her the card. And now she got herself a deal off of that card. I said, well, do you know uh, th this lady? No, I don't know her, but it's a recommendation of my friend, and uh, she's the best salesman in Mesa. And truly, she is one of the better salespeople around. She works for us. G great gal, Lelania Christofferson. Let me mention her name there. Another thing we want you to do is take a look at your website. Some of you are just putting websites up and not uh, telling much anybody about it. And I saw one the other day. Somebody said, take a look at this website and nowhere anywhere did you see West USA. So I gave a guy a call on it. You know, he, he says, you know, Bob, I know that. I know that because I went to a class the other day, and I've got to identify West USA. And I'm, I'm in the works right now of getting that fixed. So West USA is up at the top of every page. There wasn't West USA uh, listed there anywhere. He's going to take care of doing it. So he says, thanks for calling me. But I attended the class, did not know that. And here's the uh, real estate advertising rule and guidance. Clear and prominent identification of the employing broker. Aha, uh -huh. that means Hillard has got to be loud and clear with West USA there. Well, I don't think you have to say Hillard on there, but uh, it's okay if you do. Oh, we had a pool table in our garage this weekend. It's been sitting there for a year. And somebody come in and bought it and sent somebody over to pick it up and take it out of there called Prestige Billiards. They were there in about four hours, picked up the table and left with it just that quick. And they're located right around this part right here, 22230 North Black Canyon Highway. And then I found out that they actually moved some tables for the Fouts family here. So they, uh, they get around, and they came down there to Maricopa and took that table out of there and fixed it. All right. Um, one other thing, FERPTA, Foreign Investment and Real Property Tax Act of 1980. Uh, you need to get a, one of these folders here from American Title. It's got everything you need in here and talks about FERPTA, F-I-R-P-T-A. And they take care of this stuff for you. You don't have to, but they'll take care of it for you. You are responsible for it, according to the IRS. So your name is in there somewhere. Make sure that you get this from American Title. How are we working? We're working hard, right, Bob. We appreciate it. Um, as always, excuse me, wonderful information. I uh, want to encourage you also, as always, to go ahead and like us on Facebook. If you haven't done so already, it's, you can find us at facebook.com forward slash West USA Realty Inc. Uh, we're always putting up some great articles. I know we just put one up this morning in reference to uh, you'd be surprised on those that own homes that are underwater, where they're at, uh, so forth in the market. So uh, feel free to check back onto the Facebook page uh, a couple times a day. We're always uh, putting, posting, updates, events, 
great uh, material as far as the market goes. We're going to also later on today put something up here in reference to this 1031 tax exchange. We're going to provide the link so you could get on the website and send a letter to your local representatives. So again, we appreciate Dave Turnell for stopping by and talking about that. Bob, as always, thank you for a wonderful morning. And I will leave you with a quote from Confucius. He who learns but does not think is lost. He who thinks but does not learn is in great danger, folks. Thank you for joining us this morning, and go out and sell a home.